Welcome to my latest video. This video is about the Roby in Finsbury Park and about the Weavers in Stoke Newington. Well, actually not Stoke Newington, it was Newington Green, wasn't it? Um, I was involved when they started out and um, here we go straight after this introduction. The first time I ever went to the Roby was to see a band I used to know, which was an anarchist punk band called Conflict. Back then it was called the Sir George Roby, and it was named after the musical star of the same name. And the back room of the pub, which had a sliding door that separated it from the rest of the saloon bar, because there was also a public bar back then. And um, in the back room which is where the music was they used to have musical acts apparently back in the day but uh, more recently it was where they just had memorabilia and put on bands a lot of the bands that played there were irish bands <laughs> and then when punk came along <laughs> it was like a people hired it to put on punk bands because I think um, pe people who ran pubs back in those days put on music to get people in to their pub and not many pubs did punk but that was one that did and it was an anarchist punk band and I was engaged because I knew them I was their agent even though they were an anarchist band and weren't supposed to have agents I was supposed to be their friend if anybody else I was their friend and they were getting trouble from um, skinheads because they were an anarchist punk band and um, their friends with crass and <laughs> used to do shows with them and Rubella Ballet and the Boys and Girls <laughs> people like that and I was also friends with crass well sort of and but I was agent for the Boys and Girls basically they were having problems with skinheads as I say right wing skinheads and because I was slightly older than them, I was only, what, this would be probably 1980 maybe. I'd be what, I'd be 26. So they'd be like quite young actually at the time because they were like 18, 19 were the guys in the band. And so they asked me to take along some guys, big guys to be their security. So the first time I was at the Sir George Robies, it was then, I was helping Conflict do security and Luckily, we weren't needed, which is just a well, because the three or four guys that I took along weren't really a fighters. We just looked the part, frankly. But no one ever knew that, and we managed to get away with it at quite a few gigs. How we did, I don't know. Then the next time, I was approached by somebody that I'd met, a guy called Joe Giltrap, who was half of a music duo with Malcolm Rogers called Irish Miss. But for all his great powers, his love. Joe and Malcolm had taken over the Roby together with a guy called John, who was more of a businessman. He went on to, well, we'll talk about him later. Oh, they were, Joe and Malcolm played in a band, but they didn't really know much about booking bands in those days. So they asked me, because I was doing shows at the Half Moon Putney, the Cricketers, White Line in Putney. I'd been around for for quite a long time, even though I say by this time, it's, it's probably early 80s. Um, again, I'm very hazy with all these things, with all my dates, because I didn't keep diaries or anything, and um, there's very little online about all this sort of stuff, about dates and things. So, And so I helped them book a few bands, and so we put on bands that I was doing at the Cricketers. We once had a meeting, which was humorous in the extent that I booked a few bands with them, and one of the bands I'd booked was the Hank Wangford Band. And this is just one out of like, I don't know, 10 bands, and it included a pick like Steve Marriott and the Ground Dogs and Wilco Johnson. But the standout success of all people was Hank Wangford, who I never really had a lot of success with personally, but the Half Moon I know did. So I think he's more of a middle class sort of thing. I, I don't know, but... Uh, so Hank Wangford did very, very well, um, sold out a Thursday night or something, I think it was. And so we had this meeting afterwards and John, who was like not a, a music man, piped up with, well, um, this may sound a bit stupid, but why don't we book Hank Wangford every weekend? So anyway, that was that. And then John went off and he set up Turnmills, which was the nightclub and I think it's the first all night nightclub and it became 
iconic for the um, rave scene and he was like a big thing. So he often did that. I think that was more accidental because I got the feeling that John would do anything he took to make a few quid. You know, if it was mud wrestling, he would have put on mud wrestling. Malcolm and Joe carried on. Then Joe sort of, I'm not sure what happened here, but for some reason they sp um, split up. I never really got the um, reason for that. And so Malcolm stayed at the Roby and Joe went off to, well, first of all, he went to the railway. He had the railway, which is a small Irish pub right by Finchley Park Station. And the railway put on occasional Irish, just like Irish live sessions. But he eventually got the Weavers and more about that later. But anyway, at the Roby, uh, Malcolm teamed up with a guy called Brian Aldwinkle, another guy from Northern Ireland who we played with in another band, I think called Chanter, because Mar Malcolm was a, a musician. He was a multi, well he is, I mean, he's still around. He's um, a multi-instrumentalist, played the fiddle and the e guitar and all sorts of things. And so um, he and Brian teamed up to do the Roby. And th those are the years that most people know. I sort of drifted away. Um, they, as you know, put on lots of things. They did the old dayers, they did the club dog on a Friday night, that kind of thing. My big thing that I did, if you watch my Shane McGowan video, which is a link up there somewhere, then that was about, the first thing I really did at the Aerobie was I did Tuesday nights and I did, I think they did the Pogues. This is in, I thought it was 82, but someone said it was 83, but six weeks, I think it was. It was supposed to be longer, doing the Pogues every Tuesday. Somebody else said it was Wednesdays, but I thought it was Tuesdays. But anyway, um, whatever night it was, it was a Tuesday or Wednesday for every week. And after, I think the first week, it was actually pretty full. The second week, it was absolutely rammed. And by the third week, there were people that couldn't get in. I mean, even though I think that the Roby people opened up the whole pub, I mean, it's like every bar, every room, they could let people into the... I think it was actually two pounds, actually. And we had hundreds of people turn up every week. The first time, they were amazed about how much they got paid. Jem, who was the leader who did all that sort of thing, he says that was the most money they'd earned it any gig by a long way. So that was the thing. And it just got bigger and bigger. I think that was the start of their thing. Then with the pose, I went on and I did them at the at Parandon Ballroom, upstairs, the big show with the bootle foot tappers and the men they couldn't hang. And um, they just got bigger and bigger. So anyway, there you go, that's that. So the Roby went on. And what happened to the Roby was, basically Malcolm and Brian, it was very popular, but it was very hard to make money in those days. It was in the post days past Margaret Thatcher's beer orders, which basically took pubs out of the hands of your brewers and gave it to property companies, which are basically the same people who just formed property companies and owned pubs rather than brewed beer. And so people like Whitbread actually stopped doing beer. They just went into uh, property and from there they went into doing, I think, Pizza Hut and all the hotels they did, what's the um, Premier Inn, all that sort of stuff. So instead of like the brewery making money out of the pub doing well and selling beer, which meant that they could keep the rent down and everybody was happy, so they got their income from the amount of beer that was sold. The pub companies didn't own the brewery, so they were not making as much out of the beer. So they charged as much as they possibly, they were basically maximizing their bricks and mortar income. So what happened was they put the rents up totally. So anyway, like a lot of pubs at the time, the Roby was not making a lot of money. I know that Vince Power, who is the guy that owned the um, mean fiddler group offered Malcolm quite a lot of money for the uh, the lease to the pub and so he took over the lease and he turned it into the powerhouse and so he ran it himself for a while obviously the mean fiddler empire at the time was huge he was putting on festivals all over the place the flower more the flower in London all sorts of things like that had venues all over the place I think he had one stage he had 22 venues and so the powerhouse became not as not as big on his um, radar as it might have been in those named after him, Power, Vince Powerhouse, Powerhouse, you know. So I think he then leased it to someone else who was, I think Dave Robinson, one of the founders of Stiff, was involved in. And anyway, what happened was they, this is what I hear, this is not, this is not documented, this is what I heard, and I believe it's true, but if it's not true, do not sue me, okay? But I believe that whoever it was 
um, fell out with Vince because I believe they had a party one night. Or Vince's people were still running the bar and they had the booze. And the whoever it was who leased the pub were just getting no income from putting on, on shows. So they were taking the door and the mean filler group were taking the bar. And I believe that one night they had a do on there, got in the cellar and drank a load of booze or something. And Vince got the hump with it and he basically locked them out. So there was a legal challenge, I believe, which is why I was told that the powerhouse was closed for so long at the end before he's actually knocked it out. And that's because it's now knocked down and now flats. So that was the Roby. Malcolm and Brian also went off when they were doing the Roby and um, the pub company offered them another pub, the Lady Owen Arms, which was in Islington, which basically was going to be knocked down to build at something. It has been knocked down since, obviously. And so I think it was very cheap and also quite small. So they made it like a... Little Roby or something, up and coming bands who were like, you know, three or four bands a night, new bands. And I went there from time to time. It's quite a nice place to go and have a Newcastle brown ale. And um, there you go. And a late night thing, because I used to, not now, I, nowadays I'm in bed by midnight, hopefully a lot earlier. But back then I used to. I used to finish my job at say, where I was working or time out, whatever, and go out and spend most of the night. Um, drinking then up in the morning bright as a daisy and off I go and do the rest of my thing those days are long gone let me tell you so let's go to Joe Joe Giltrap went off from the Roby and then he got the Weaver's Arms which it was then in Newington Green Road and it's like a one bar pub like the Cricketers and basically he made it a mecca of acoustic music upscale Irish music and Americana like when I was running the Cricketers I made a lot of contacts in Austin mainly through a guy called Wes McGee and whiskey is my driver whiskey is my driver who's a British artist who did a lot of things with Austin so we put on and I organised tours quite often with people like Alvin Crow. I guess I'm just too country on my own good and um, Freddie Kirsch. Hello Freddie, I believe he watches these. And I can't remember, there are lots more, but they were very good. And so we used to put on that and that was thing. So anyway, after we stopped doing it, after I stopped doing it, I went to work for Time Out instead of putting on bands. And the Weavers sort of took over my mantle for doing that. So the Weavers became known for five years, I would say the Weavers was the premier place to go to watch anything like that, like the Balamani Gators, like Americana, they put on top name American Axe. Joe was very active in it. I helped him occasionally. I did things with him. We worked together. We're still sort of friends now. He's moved back to Ireland now and we haven't seen each other for ages. I mean, he was dedicated to the music and making it like a really good experience. But again, because these pub pub companies like just just like squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and get as much out of the tenant or the landlord of the pub as they possibly can. It is incredibly hard to make a living out of it. And so, unfortunately, the Weavers had to go and it and it closed down and that was that. And it, I, I'm not sure if it's actually even is still there. I've not been up there for ages, but I used to go there quite a lot. Now, I lived always in South London. I lived in Lewisham, Forest Hill, all around there, New Cross, and yet I would still go to shows quite often at the Weavers because it's always a good place to go and they put on some fantastic stuff and it was really a shame it's all gone. So if you've got any memories of the Weavers or the Roby or even the Lady Owen Arms, please let me know by commenting down below. Like this, and it was one of the more rambly ones, I'm, I do I apologise, then you will probably like the other ones I've done a lot better. So look at my playlist, see what you like. Please like it if you like this one. Please subscribe. Please join me again as we explore all kinds of things to do with my life in music and whatever else I did, which is quite a lot. See you next time. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.